Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And the lands of Skyrim serve as the home to all sorts of life. From cute woodland critters spread across her forests, to thriving cities of human beings, Skyrim, and indeed the entire world of the Elder Scrolls franchise, is just teeming with living beings. However, some of the creatures this game exposes us to aren't quite as adorable as one would hope. And many of the organisms inhabiting these lands are some really horrifying fellows that don't belong anywhere but your worst nightmares. In a universe of such cruel gods, evil mages, and powerful magic, I suppose we really shouldn't be surprised though. No matter, being so spooky, many of these disturbing beings are also pretty interesting when you begin to dissect them. Figuratively speaking, of course. So, that's our objective for today. Sit back and relax as we take a look at five of the most terrifying creatures in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Starting off, we have the Feral Falmer. So, normal Falmer by themselves are some pretty repulsive fellows. Once a majestic and beautiful race of Mur known as the Snow Elves, following the conquest of Skyrim by the Nords, they were forced to beg the dwarves into allowing them to seek shelter in their underground cities. The Dwemer agreed, under one condition. The Snow Elves would have to consume a strange fungus that caused some disgusting mutations. In no position to bargain, the desperate species agreed. And so, thousands of years later, all this time in the dark underground, and the effects of that fungus slowly transformed the Snow Elves into the hideous and hostile race of Fulmer we all know them as today. However, the Dawnguard DLC introduced players to a mysterious, new, even more sinister type of the Twisted Goblin. The Feral Fulmer became an enemy we could encounter within the Forgotten Vale and its subterranean caves. Feral Fulmer have successfully managed to pull off an even more frightening appearance than their non-feral cousins, seemingly being covered in blood, sporting massive sharp teeth, as well as a much more hunched over posture. Notably, while normal Fulmer tend to fashion armor out of Charis exoskeletons, the feral ones appear to prefer going all natural instead. So, other than looks, what exactly distinguishes ferals? What else makes them so special and what's the story behind them? Well, contrary to their intimidating looks, on average, ferals are a good bit weaker than your standard Falmer, and everything about their visual characteristics and equipment suggests they're much less intelligent. Again, no effort to wear armor. They also prefer to use steel weapons rather than the typical Charis-made Falmer swords and blades that non-ferals use, implying that this variant is just not advanced enough to make its own gear, and the creatures depend on whatever they can find. During the events of the Dawnguard DLC, we learn that hordes of ferals have invaded the Forgotten Vale, and have actually been attacking and slaughtering tribes of regulars. This obviously seems like a big deal, but the game places surprisingly little emphasis on why exactly it is all these feral Falmer have come here. None of the characters throughout the quests really seem to comment much on ferals, and their origins aren't directly explained away either. They're just sort of enemies that exist in the Forgotten Vale. That said, despite any firm explanation by Bethesda, there is a popular theory. Some argue that Feral Falmer are really just regular Falmer who have been infected with vampirism. Vampirism was one of Dawnguard's central themes, so from a narrative standpoint, this would be quite satisfying, and would explain why they're hostile to everything but other Ferals. Vampires don't typically eat other vampires. Also, players have pointed out that many Ferals seem to have what looks to be the beginning of wings forming on their backs almost like those we see in Vampire Lords. Though, this is anything but solid evidence. At the end of the day, we don't know what Feral Falmer are, what they want, or why they're here. All we do know is that they are very spooky indeed. Next on our list, we briefly leave the realms of men to journey to the terrifying plane of oblivion that is the Soul Cairn. It's said this is the dimension where the souls of any beings who have been trapped in the mortal world are condemned to live out all of eternity. 
It's populated largely by the depressed and hopeless spirits of people who have been here for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's rather sad, but among the faces we can meet within this place is no shortage of foes as well. And perhaps the most mysterious and intimidating of them all are the Keepers. Towering beasts that don full sets of dragonbone armor, and have a strange black mist and bright purple dots in substitute for a head, though do seem to have pale flesh elsewhere. They are very hostile to the player, and considering their high base health and use of dragonbone equipment, can present a major obstacle to any adventurer seeking to navigate this area. Much like the Feral Falmer we mentioned earlier, no one's really sure what Keepers are or how they came to be. Really, the same is true of just about any of the opponents we might cross swords with within the Karen. However, at least the other enemies are familiar skeletons or Draugr, with a more normal, human-like anatomy. These are something entirely different. We do have one idea what their purpose may be, though. During the quest, Beyond Death, wherein we attempt to rescue a vampire by the name of Valerica, who's been stuck here for the past few thousand years, and bring her back to Tamriel, when we first approach her, she'll be trapped in a castle, bound by a force field. And the only way we can remove said force field will be by slaying three keepers. Perhaps this quest casts light on their names. Their existence seems crucial to trapping, or keeping, Valerica trapped. Though, we're still left with the questions of how they were created. Why are they necessary? And who the heck gave them so many dragon bones? Questions only the Seekers themselves may know the answers to, and the Seekers aren't giving those away. Coming at number three, we shift our sights to a much more common type of villain, the Slaughterfish. Thankfully, a lot more is understood about these twisted sea creatures than anything else we've covered so far, and we've had quite the long amount of time to get to know them, with the fish having a deep background in the Elder Scrolls franchise. But more on their meta-history later. Slaughterfish are an aquatic foe we can encounter throughout Skyrim's various rivers, lakes, and her coastline. Easily identifiable by their long, alligator-gar-like snout and body, they're really the only type of aggressive animal you should look out for when swimming in the world's waterways. Their eggs, often found on the side of riverbeds, are a key alchemical ingredient in fortify stamina and damage health potions. But what I find the most interesting about these carnivores, besides those blood-curling chompers, is that they've appeared in a lot of Elder Scrolls games, and evolved a good bit throughout the series. First being introduced in the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, they sported a much more eel-like, yet still not any less intimidating aesthetic, and were likewise a common villain in ponds and rivers. Then reprising their roles in Morrowind with much bulkier bodies, and especially heads. After Tez III, they were once again the hostile sea critter of choice in Oblivion, where they resembled a freaky combination of angler and catfish and proved to be some pretty pesky swimmers. Just one game before Bethesda settled on the shape and texture we know them from in Skyrim. While it's easy to write off the constantly shifting appearance of the slaughterfish throughout so many games as Bethesda just making some creative changes, I like to imagine that perhaps the slaughterfish we encounter in Skyrim is a different breed than that in Cyrodiil or Morrowind. Or that maybe slaughterfish is just a general term, used to describe a whole number of carnivorous aquatic species. Or maybe Bethesda just can't make up their minds. You be the judge. For fourth spot, let's shift our focus away from the seas and back to the more magical and mysterious land. Hagravens are the poorly postured, almost half-raven women we can encounter in many of Skyrim's caves and forests. They're not very friendly, and their preferred battle strategy is largely dependent on a combination of moderately powerful spells and the occasional scratch of their sharp claws. They commonly can be found in the company of Forsworn at the redoubts and camps, implying some sort of possible alliance and an ability to communicate and work with humans to further their own interests. Yet, at the same time as mentioned, many Hagravens prefer to live alone or with other members of their species. While it hasn't been explicitly 100% verified, 
There is a lot of evidence in Skyrim that hints that Hagravens were actually born as normal women, who later in life underwent some form of ritual or process to transform into the freaks of nature we know them as. Moira, the Hagraven we meet during the quest A Night to Remember, and may or may not have gotten engaged to, but that's another story, believe it or not, is cited as the sister to a niece, an elderly Nord witch, who is very much human, in one of Anise's unsent letters to a friend we can find in her den. The game's files also display the two as related. So right there, the game looks to confirm that Hagravens were likely born human. Furthermore, in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind's Blood Moon DLC, three human, Breton witches could be met at a location called the Altar of Thrond on Solstheim, named Isobel, Etienne, and Felice. And in Skyrim's Dragonborn DLC, which also takes place on Solstheim just a couple hundred years later, if we go to the Altar of Thrond, we'll find three Hagravens, named Isabelle, Etienne, and Felice. Bethesda's basically spelling out that since Morwind, somehow these three women transformed into Hagravens. Though, how such a transformation would happen remains anyone's guess. Something involving her scene, Daedric God of the Hunt and patron of lycanthropes, would make a lot of sense. Her scene is heavily associated with werewolves and werebears, so something to do with bird people isn't out of the realm of possibility. And those three raven sisters we mentioned, Isabelle, Etienne, and Felice, were all followers of her scene back in Morrowind. So maybe after a bit of time, he decided to bestow his gift upon the trio. For whatever reason though, I'm unsure. Something I've always considered is maybe becoming a Hagraven is a form of punishment Hercene bestows upon followers that betray him. It would explain why they're so angry all the time. Though again, it's all uncertain. Fingers crossed we learn more in The Elder Scrolls VI. And finally, last on our list, Seekers may in fact be the most frightening of any of the characters we've covered thus far. They mostly serve Hermaeus Mora, Daedric god of all things knowledge, and can commonly be found in his equally unsettling plane of oblivion, Apocrypha. It is worth pointing out that some Seekers seem to prefer Mirak over Hermaeus Mora, but that's beside the point. If Hagravens are a combination of birds and people, these Seekers seem to be a combo of octopuses and wizards, because my gosh, are they not uncomfortable to look at. When we encounter them in Mora's dimension, they'll typically bombard us with an assortment of advanced spells, and can even turn themselves invisible, implying these are some advanced fellows. But I feel now's an appropriate time to ask, where do they come from? Well, Lesser Daedra, i.e. every type of Daedra that's not a god, so Seekers included, are all usually born from their patron god. So in this instance, that would suggest Hermaeus Mora created the Seekers, which makes sense. Why he went for such an appearance would be beyond me. But here's the thing, there seems to be more to the Seekers' story than Hermaeus Mora just snapping his fingers together and manifesting them. You see, in the Elder Scrolls Online, we interact with Hermaeus Mora a little bit, and we also meet some of his human followers. In that game, his normal human followers are referred to as Seekers. Some have put two and two together and believe that the Seekers we face off against in Skyrim are really just normal people that Hermaeus Mora heavily mutated and influenced. The in-game book, Doors to Oblivion, lends a lot of credence to this theory. That book details the tale of a man by the name of Morian Zenis, written by the perspective of one of his students. Apparently, Morian had aspired to visit Apocrypha all his life. After years and years of research, he was finally able to. When he arrived in Apocrypha, he was able to communicate with that student, thanks to some complex spells. The author notes, though, that slowly his communications with Morian became less and less coherent. It was as if Morian was losing part of himself. Before long, the kid attests that Morian went completely mad and just halted all communication, never to be heard from again. It's possible that his time in Apocrypha was slowly corrupting and transforming Morian 
into a seeker. It's really disturbing to imagine that all of these seemingly nameless magical entities were once people at a time. Admittedly, it's still just a theory. Though, regardless of whether it's accurate or not, I think we can all agree these creatures are still pretty petrifying. And with those final words of terror, we are going to wrap up my top five horrifying creatures in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. Which of the beans we covered today gives you the most heebie-jeebies? And what creatures do you think I missed that deserve a mention in a part two if we get around to it? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.